Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I welcome you to the series History, Science and Faith in Islam. It is a narrative designed to foster a renewal of faith based on knowledge. This session continues our coverage of the fall of Granada in 1492, an event that marks the end of Muslim rule in Spain and is a hinge around which world history revolves. Historians have pondered over the decay and disintegration of the Maghrib in the 14th and 15th centuries. Ibn Khaldun, who lived between 1332 and 1406, lived through this period of instability in North Africa. Born in Tunis, which was at the time a part of the Hafsid Empire, known as Ifrigia, Ibn Khaldun had an opportunity to travel widely in the Maghrib and witness firsthand the mechanics of the rise and fall of local dynasties. Much of his youth was spent in North Africa. In later years, he migrated to Egypt where he served as an ambassador and advisor to the Mamluks. It was Ibn Khaldun who was given charge by the Mamluks to negotiate the surrender of the city of Damascus to Tamerlane in the year 1400 CE. Ibn Khaldun is justly regarded as the father of sociology and the philosophy of history. He was the first to advance a general theory of the rise and fall of civilizations, which he based on the observations of the Maghrib. According to him, there is always a state of tension between the nomads and the city dwellers. History moves forward as the resolution of such tensions. The nomads possess in abundance the qualities of asabiya, which in a general sense means group feeling and group loyalty. By contrast, city life tends to dilute and destroy group feeling. According to Ibn Khaldun, power is political. Asabiya fosters political and military unity and enables the nomads to overcome the sedentary city dwellers. In time, the nomads themselves settle down and become city dwellers and in turn are overcome by a new wave of nomads. Asabiya thus becomes the key to political power and the building block of nations and empires. It is the glue the cement that binds people together and demands and obtains the sacrifice of individuals for monumental tasks. When Asabiya is diluted or destroyed, civilizations lose the glue that holds them together and they disintegrate. This theory is widely used as a model to explain the rise and fall of civilizations. However, Ibn Khaldun's ideas present enormous difficulties from an Islamic perspective. Islam is against Asabiya, based on race, color, or national origin. To quote the Quran, we made you into nations and tribes so that you may recognize and know each other, not that you may despise each other. Islam seeks to create a global community, enjoining what is right, forbidding what is wrong, and believing in God. Such a community transcends the asabiya based on race, region, or national origin, and embraces all nations. 
While it is true, as Ibn Khaldun maintains, that Asabiyah enables common people to achieve uncommon results and build nations and empires, it is also true that nations built on Asabiyah are by nature aggressive and expansive. They become predatory on their neighbors and foster feelings of superiority or other nations and tribes. Hitler's Germany offers an example. The Nazis built a nation-state based on German Asabia, nationalism based on the superiority of the German race or other races. This enabled them temporarily to dominate Europe. But Nazi Germany collapsed, in part because other nation-states would not accept German ascendancy. In a philosophical sense, Asabiya frees the individual from his or her ego and places the walls of egocentric exclusion at the national or racial boundary. The prison of race, tribe, or nation replaces the prison of the ego. Islam, by contrast, liberates humankind not only from the individual ego, but also from the prison of racism, tribalism, and nationalism. The outward limits of the Islamic civilization are set at the global community. All races, tribes, and nations are included in this civilization. The most difficult issue with the philosophy of Ibn Khaldun is that it offers no prospect of internal renewal. When a tribe or nation settles down and softens up, enjoying the pleasures of city life, must it necessarily yield to another group which is sedentary and more rustic? This is contrary to observation. The universal religions of the world provide the possibility of self-renewal. Islam provides for the renewal of individuals and nations from within. Individuals and nations do decay through their own folly, and by divine grace they renew themselves and rise up once again. Islamic history is animated by this recurrent theme of renewal. It is the possibility of the self-renewal that animates this series on history, science, and faith in Islam. The appearance of a reformer at the turn of each century is expected by a large majority of Muslims in the world. Century after century, from the al muhaddith of the Maghrib to Uthman Dan Fudio of Nigeria and the Mahdi of the Sudan, one sees this recurrent attempt at renewal of Islamic life and a regeneration of Islamic civilization. It is the possibility of renewal that animates the collective efforts of Muslims. The reasons for the fall of Granada were demographic, economic, cultural, religious, and ideological. The continuous wars in Andalus sapped the manpower of the entire Maghrib. The Crusades were a civilizational conflict wherein Europe hurled itself again and again at the Islamic world for almost 500 years. The battle lines extended from the Andalusian Peninsula across North Africa, Egypt, Palestine, Syria, Anatolia, and Sicily into southeastern Europe. Andalus provided a complex problem for Maghribi rulers. Any ruler, whether Maronite or Hafsid, who coveted the leadership of the Maghrib and desired the title of Amir al-Muslimin, was duty-bound to defend Andalus against the Christians. Andalus was like a quicksand. The politics of the Iberian Peninsula was shifty. The Muslim Andalusians had lost the capacity to defend themselves and had come to depend upon soldiers from North Africa. 
even after the defeat of Rio Solado in 1341. When the North Africans finally turned their back on Andalus, the court of Granada continued to depend on soldiers from Africa. The Maghribi manhood bled. What was not lost on the battlefield was destroyed by disease. The Black Plague of 1346 to 1360 hit North Africa particularly hard. Entire villages were destroyed. Politics and culture both suffered. In 1360, most of the Crusader army, led by Louis IX of France, perished from the Black Plague at the gates of Tunis. Agricultural production was a casualty of the drop in population. When food production dropped, many of the settled tribes became nomads. This in turn had an impact on state revenues. The drop in agricultural revenues and the cost of continuous wars in Andalus squeezed the treasuries of the Maghreb. Initially, during the Murabitun and the al muhaddisin periods, between 1050 and 1212, the accumulated wealth of Andalus had paid for the wars. But as the bulk of Andalusian peninsula fell to the Christians between 1085 and 1248, the source of this wealth also disappeared. A poorer Maghrib could not sustain a standing army. Political centralization requires capital because capital is required to pay for a standing army which provides cohesion for a large political entity. With the Maghrib in economic decline, fragmentation set in. When the wealth of Andalus was exhausted, the emirs of Maghrib turned to trade with the city-states of Italy for their tax revenues. The al had signed a trade concession with Genoa in 1168. In 1236, the Hafsids entered into a treaty with Venice and Genoa. In 1265, al-Mustansir of the Hafsids gave special privileges to the French and the Sicilians. Unfortunately, this trade, while it brought prosperity to a few rich merchants in the coast, further eroded the political authority of the emirs because they were now dependent on the merchant elite for their revenues. The Genovese often acted as spies for their fellow Christian Spaniards, providing them military, political, and social intelligence, which was of enormous benefit to the Crusaders. The southerly trade routes across the Sahara to the Sudan was still active, but they shifted between the western route through Sijil Masha and a more central route through Ghat and Khairawun, depending on the safety of the routes. There was a silver lining to the dark clouds the political fragmentation of the Maghreb and the emergence of competing emirates provided a haven for scholars and men of arts. On the surface, culture flourished between 1250 and 1350. But this was a culture borrowed from Andalus, sustained by the influx of refugees who were driven out by the Crusaders. Culture must have roots in the soil for it to provide the foundation of a civilization. A borrowed culture is like a tree without roots. A mere whiff of wind will knock it down. When Andalus fell, along with it disappeared the culture of North Africa. Furthermore, the influence of the Spanish refugees was not always positive. The Andalusians were more secular in their thinking than the North Africans. Perhaps it was the result of their cosmopolitan culture 
wherein Muslims, Christians, and Jews all participated. The immigrants tended to look upon politics as separate from its ethical foundation. They were often involved in intrigues of the Maronite and Hafsids and tended to depend for their survival on playing off the North African courts against the powerful Banu Hilal tribe to the south. The most important reason for the fragmentation of the Maghrib and the loss of, the, of Andalus was the loss of legitimacy of rule. Legitimacy is a central issue that has haunted Islamic history since the assassinations of Uthman Radilawanhu and Ali Radilawanhu. A ruler and a system of government that is accepted as legitimate elicits its support from the people. Such support is essential to building a civilization. Conversely, rule that is considered illegitimate is constantly challenged and can only be sustained by force. This was well understood by the Shia Fatimids, the Sunni Murabitun, and the Mutazilite al muhaddisin Each of these dynasties packaged their appeal in religious terminology and sought the legitimacy in an Islamic framework. Thus, the Fatimids claim their descent from Ali ibn Abu Talib radiallahu The Murabitun claimed an orthodox reformation against the excesses of the Fatimids and the Kharijites. And the al muhaddithin claimed a rational basis for rule based on reason, consensus, and the Quran. The disappearance of a centralized empire in the Maghrib made the issue of political legitimacy particularly acute. The Amirs were unsuccessful in expressing their legitimacy in religious terms, as had the Fatimids, the Murabitun, and the al muhaddisin Politics became increasingly separated from religion. The divergence of politics from religious ethics was at the core of the loss of Andalus. The regional courts became a paradise for psychophants. Historians wrote and poets sang in glorious verse of their patron emirs whenever they won a small skirmish or built a minor monument. Gone was the grand idea of building a universal Islamic community in the Maghrib. Great efforts spring from great ideas. Only faith as a superordinate idea can demand and obtain the willing sacrifice that is the basis of great efforts. Without an idea that transcends individual egos, great collective achievements are not possible. Without a superordinate vision, the masses are like wildfires that burn everything in front of them. But when they are held together by a common idea, they are like a powerful laser beam that inscribes its edict on the edifice of history. Ideas are the glue, the cement, the force, and the power that holds people together. They form the ethical basis, the foundation of a civilization. At the core of Islam is the idea of Tawheed, which liberates the individual from his egotistical prison and propels him into a universal mold. Tawheed implies a God-centered civilization, wherein culture, art, politics, and sociology all spring from their focus on the omnipresence of God. The Muslims lost their bearing in history when they lost their focus on Tawheed. Legitimacy of rule then became an item of convenience to be bestowed upon whoever held the big stick. The rulers, the soldiers, the merchants, and the writers 
as well as the ulama, all share this guilt. The Khazis and religious scholars in the Maghrib went along with the divestiture of religion from politics, preaching the Friday khutbah in the name of whoever was in power. Only after al muhaddisin had disintegrated did the orthodox vision of Islam find its place in the sun, but by then the center of gravity of world history had moved away from the Maghrib to other parts of the world. It is useful to compare the historical experience of the Maliki school, which is most widely practiced in the Maghrib with the experience of the Hanafi school in Asia. The children of Islam constructed similar but different historical edifices using the spiritual and intellectual material left by Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik. The comparative latitude provided by Imam Abu Hanifa in the school of fiqh named after him provided the Muslims of Asia the tools to adapt and grow with the tide of history. The Turks adapted the Hanafi school and when Fatimid power challenged the Abbasids in the 10th century, the Turks became champions of the Abbasid Khilafat and its protectors. The Seljuks and the Ghaznavids alike fought the Fatimids to the blade in places as far away as Multan in Pakistan and Baghdad in Iraq. More importantly, the Hanafis showed a remarkable ability to assimilate great ideas as they emerged out of the ideological conflicts of the 9th and the 10th centuries. Thus, when the Asharites carried the day against the Mutazilites in the 10th century, Asharite influence melted into Hanafi Asia. The ideas of Al-Ghazali, who passed away in the year 1111, were absorbed with equal ease when the Mongol eruption came between 1219 and 1301, and much of Asia lay in ruins, Sufi ideas triumphed. Islam became more spiritual, and Sufi ideas also became a part of the Hanafi Melo. Thus, the Islam that emerged by the 16th century, when the Safavid and Mughal dynasties were founded, and the Ottomans were at the zenith of their power, was an amalgam of the great ideas that have flowed from Medina, Kufa, Baghdad, Bukhara, and Samarkand. Out of this amalgam came the giants of the ages, personages like Al-Ghazali, Hafiz, Rumi, Abdul Khadr Jilani, Mu'ayyuddin Chishti, Bahauddin Naqshban, Ahmad Sarhindi, Shah Waliullah, and Muhammad Iqbal. And it is this amalgamated folk Islam that is practiced by Turks, Pakistanis, Iranians, Indians, Bengalis, and Central Asians today. The experience of the Maliki Maghrib was different. For three long centuries, the Maliki school took a back seat to Fatimid, Murabitun, and al muhaddisin ideologies. When it did express itself freely after 1230, political power had slipped from the Maghrib and the military political initiative in that region has passed on to the Spaniards and the Portuguese. And then after a brief interlude of Ottoman protection to the French and the Italians. When the Maghribi Muslims did accept Sufi ideas in the 14th century, it was out of necessity to protect themselves against the onslaught of the Europeans. The Maliki Maghrib did not experience the amalgamation and evolution of ideas that was expressed and experienced in Asia. This explains why political, social, and cultural fragmentation proceeded so rapidly in the Maghrib during the 14th and the 15th century. Events in the Maghrib moved rapidly after the Turks captured Istanbul in 1453. Pope Nicholas V called for a new crusade. 
On the Eastern Front, the rising tide of Turkish power war was more than a match for the combined powers of Europe. But in the West, it was a different story. In 1458, the Portuguese occupied the important fortress of al khasr and used it as a base to attack Morocco all across the Atlantic course. In 1469, Tangier was lost to the Portuguese. By 1471, the Marinites had disappeared from Morocco and the region was in disarray. This general fragmentation explains the inability of the North Africans to come to the aid of the Granadans. In 1469, at the behest of the Pope, Isabella of Aragon married Ferdinand of Castile and the Spanish state was born. Abul Hassan Ali, a capable, brave, and chivalrous Amir, ruled Granada at the time. At other times, he might have left his imprint on Spanish history. But his court was ravaged by internal dissensions and intrigues so characteristic of the Maurib at the time. In 1482, Ferdinand attacked Alhama, a city located about 20 miles from the city of Granada. Abul Hassan bravely defended the city, but had to abandon it when news reached him of the rebellion of his son Abu Abdullah, named Bobdil by the Spaniards. Abu Abdullah had none of the courage, stamina, and integrity of his father. A battle between father and son left the forces of Granada weak and vulnerable. Malaga fell in 1483. As the Castilians approached the capital city, the brother of Abul Hassan, Zagal, offered valiant and stout resistance but was constantly thwarted by Bobdil. In 1489, the city of Safar fell. Having destroyed the territories around Granada, Ferdinand retired to Cordoba, there to raise an army of 80,000 for a final assault on Granada. In 1490, he returned at the head of this host, built a city of siege called Santa Fe, which means Holy Faith, and cut all lines of communication between Granada and the outside world. Resistance was desperate, but faced with starvation, Granada surrendered on January 3rd, 1492. The cross displaced the crescent in the once mighty Umayyad province of Andalus. An empire died and a new empire was born. The terms of surrender guaranteed freedom of worship and the right to emigrate. But within six years, the treaty was abandoned and the Inquisition was unleashed with all its fury upon the hapless population under the direction of the cruel bishop, Jimenez. The Jews had already been expelled in 1492. It was now the turn of the Muslims. They were given the option of either converting to Christianity are being banished to North Africa. Those who were caught saying the Shahada were hanged from their tongues. Water was cut off from Muslim homes so that they could not do their wudu before prayer. Children were forcibly inducted into Catholic schools. The wives of the believers were sold as slaves in Europe. Faced with this oppression, the Muslims of Granada offered what little resistance they could. There were a series of uprisings in 1496, 1501, 1568, 1609, each of which was put down with ruthless cruelty. Finally, in 1609, the last of the Muslims boarded a decrepit boat and set sail for Morocco. The curtain fell on Muslim Andalusia. Some migrated to America. The roster of immigrants into America on board the early ships, arriving from Sevilla, that is Seville, contains the name of many Muslims, African as well as European men and women. 
This concludes our session on the fall of Granada. In the next session, inshallah, we'll cover the sack of Constantinople by the Latin Crusaders in 1204 of the Common Era. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.